40% of primary care is psychiatry, and it makes up a lot of specialty care too. Yet most of us get no training after medical school. So let's take a crash course in psychiatry from the co-director of the Train New Trainers Primary Care Psychiatry Fellowship. Hey, this is Brad Block, host of The Physician's Guide to Doctoring. This is a personal and professional development podcast for physicians where we have experts on the show that try to teach us everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. We talk a lot about side gigs on this show. So if your side gig or even your main gig is a medical technology product that you want to pitch, or you're even in the early stages of product development, you could benefit from consulting with Charm Economics. They use government data, peer-reviewed journals, and trade literature to support and enhance your business model at all stages. Whether an early stage pitch deck creation, return on investment modeling, or peer-reviewed article production, they can help. See how Charm Economics can transform your business development today so you can focus on building your product, growing your network, and implementing your vision. Check them out at charmeconomics.com. Dr. Robert McCarron, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Brad, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Good to be here. You lecture on psychiatry for primary care physicians, but you know we have a lot of specialists in the audience, and you know, we've been finding more and more that we need training in mental health issues in psychiatry as well. So to introduce you, Dr. McCarron, double-boarded in internal medicine in psychiatry. He's the founding director of the UC Davis Train New Trainers Primary Care Psychiatry Fellowship, which is a one-year program designed to train primary care providers in the essentials of psychiatry and pediatric behavioral health. He's also a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine and Assistant Dean for CME at UC Irvine. So again, Dr. McCarron, thank you so much for your time and coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, again, uh, really excited to talk about this important topic in medicine. So yeah, so I'm an otolaryngologist, and a lot of what I deal with has either little bits of mental health that need to be navigated or a significant portion, if not all, of what the patient is being seen for is related. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues who's in pain medicine, and a lot of what she does is rooted in psychiatry. And, you know, my gastroenterology colleague, so many, it's not just primary care that we really need a lot more training and expertise in order to better help our patients. So I think this is going to be a good episode for really everybody. Maybe not pathologists, right? Yeah. Maybe not pathologists or maybe not radiologists. Yeah. But yeah, most other physicians, certainly I think it's going to be applicable. You know, the bottom line is most patients present to their doctor with concerns of pain. That's the number one complaint. And I consider that to be physical and or emotional pain. I put those two together. And that's what we do as docs is we want to make sure we're addressing really the number one complaint to any physician, and that's pain. So give us just an overview of what you're teaching there in the Train New Trainers program. Several years ago, I really struggled with the fact that many of the patients I was seeing had to wait months, months to see a psychiatrist. And many of the patients I was seeing in the emergency room had to wait days and sometimes weeks to be seen by a psychiatrist or even get admitted to a hospital because of psychiatric conditions that were severe. I really wanted to expand access to mental health care delivery, to behavioral health care delivery, including substance use disorders related issues. What I decided to do is figure out where most of the mental health care delivery is already taking place, and that's in the primary care setting. It's not by psychiatrists or psychologists or social workers, but the front line for behavioral health care is in the primary care setting, and as you mentioned, also specialty care as well. Problem though, Brad, is this. Those same providers who deliver about 70% of all behavioral health care delivery did not get the training. They didn't get the training. So for example, internal medicine residents spend three years learning about cardiology and pulmonology and hematology and all the ologies. But psychiatry is usually not something that's high on the list. In fact, if you're doing an internal medicine residency, you have zero minutes required for clinical training or rotation training in psychiatry. So imagine spending three years not learning a lot about psychiatry, getting out of your residency, spending about 40% of your day working with patients who have psychiatric issues like depression, anxiety, substance use disorders, chronic pain that is related to psychiatric issues as well. So what we decided to do at University of California, Irvine is train up these PCPs, train them on how to assess, diagnose, treat, and prevent common psychiatric conditions, right? Like anxiety, crippling anxiety, depression, 
the number one cause of disability worldwide and certainly in this country. An unexplained physical symptom, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that. And so we're able to train these docs in the course of one year outside of their normal clinic hours to learn the essentials of what we call primary care psychiatry. Recently, we also started another program training in the area of child and adolescent psychiatry. We train pediatricians. And then very recently, very excited to say we started a training trainers primary care team fellowship, team standing for training in education in addiction medicine. Love those train. acronyms. <laughs> yeah. No, I, anyway, yeah, it's, internal it's, medicine, y'all love your acronyms. acronyms. <laughs> That's why we did this, to really do expand access to those who really are in need. I bet 85, 86% of our fellows over the last three years come from designated underserved areas. They're practicing in underserved areas with those patients who need it, who need it the most. Well, listen, you make a great argument for it. You make a great argument for spending maybe less time in the ICU if you're going to be practicing outpatient medicine, right? Like if you're going to be a hospitalist, I get it. Treat the sickest of the sick because then you really learn a ton. But if you're going to be practicing outpatient medicine, how much time do you really need to be spending patients managing a vent in the ICU when really those you should be spending all that time doing the things that you're actually doing, which is really what this podcast is all about, is trying to teach physicians the practical information we need to be the best physicians we can be. So now we've got 24 minutes left to really teach <laughs> everything we can possibly teach our colleagues here about, about psychiatrists. So what's one big lesson that you like people to take away from your training programs? You can do it in 23 minutes. You know, really what it comes down to is we want our colleagues in primary care to feel more comfortable because we know this. We know that if you're spending 40, 45% of your day each day at work working with patients who are struggling with behavioral health issues and you don't know how to deal with them, you don't know how to address them, how to treat them, that's a bad day for everyone, right? The message we want to get out is primary care providers and doctors can learn how to do this. Now, are they going to be psychiatrists? No. Are they going to be experts in psychiatry? No. But we want them to feel very comfortable and be pretty expert in the area of what we call primary care psychiatry, which is looking at mild and moderate illness, right? Mild and moderate depression, mild and moderate anxiety, and addressing early stages of eating disorders, early stages of substance use disorders, one in three. One in three Americans are going to suffer from a substance use disorder issue in their lifetime. So we're really talking right? about mood disorders and not thought disorders, right? We're leaving the thought disorders to the psychiatrist, but mood disorders, anxiety, depression, and all the complications that stem from that, that's really what we're talking about, correct? Correct. If someone's having really severe illness like schizophrenia, for example, or really out of control, difficult to treat bipolar disorder, severe psychiatric illness... I think is better treated by the psychiatrist, certainly. Now, there are some areas in this country, rural areas, underserved areas, where there may not be a psychiatrist. And so we do train our primary care docs, our fellows, to at least be able to make a basic assessment on someone with severe illness. Now, whether or not they're going to be able to treat them long term is a different issue. And I agree with you, ideally. Ideally, we would like the psychiatrist and psychologist to address those more severe and persistently ill issues. So let's say we have a patient with a mood disorder that we think might have a mood disorder. And given yeah. the stigma, some of the patients have insight into that. They're like, yeah, I know I'm a really nervous person. I'm a really anxious. Person. And they might give us a window there. Right. And then, you know, you take it. Right. Oh, have you ever thought about talking to someone? Have you ever thought about taking treatment? Have you ever thought about medication? You can take that window. But let's say it's someone that doesn't necessarily have insight and you think they might have a mood disorder. What's the best way to broach that subject? So I think that when someone has stigma, a stigma against mental illness, I think that's insight. I think that's insight. We know doctors have stigma against mental illness. And let me go a step further, Brad. I think we all have stigmatizing thoughts against illness, against medical issues, against ENT issues, against nasal polyps, against whatever it is. No one really wants to be ill for the most part. Except right? allergies. Everybody Except seems allergies. to want allergies, <laughs> and if you test them and tell them that they don't have allergies, they can get really upset. So there's no stigma you got, against that, but everything else- you, you test me again, yeah. But really, if you really think about it, like I don't like going to my doctor at all. You should find and a I new doctor. And I think there's a- yeah, Exactly. There's a stigmatizing effect here with just not being well, with having illness or not feeling well. And I think that's even more with mental conditions, behavioral health conditions, certainly. So here's what I do. This is my approach. 
particularly as an internist, I let my patients know that everything we experience, if you stub your toe, for example, we experience that in the brain. It's actually not the toe, right? It's at the top of the brain, the cerebral cortex, where we ultimately will experience that pain. Depression is the same way, right? Depression is the same way. I also make it really clear that as a doc, I treat hypertension, I treat diabetes, I treat thyroid issues and cancer. And I see depression and anxiety, for example, very similar to all of those other conditions. In fact, depression and anxiety are often comorbid with those other conditions, right? I really try and let the patients that I'm working with know that this is not very dissimilar to having high blood pressure, right? It's something that we keep an eye on. It's something that we can address. It's something that we can treat. It's not always just with medication. We have great psychotherapies now that we can use to treat these conditions. And then you might not have an answer for this because it might be very dependent on the patient, right? I'm giving you an out, but let's say you get pushback there. No, no, yeah. no, not me. Or like, yeah, I guess maybe, but no, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. So, and that happens a lot, actually. And I would also say that happens a lot just with diabetes, right? I'll use it as an example. I don't want to take insulin. I'm fine. I feel fine, right? And a lot of that is denial, but not because the patient's bad in any way. It could be because they're scared. It could be because they don't have the full education on what's happening. They don't know who's ever talked to them about it. It could be stigma. It could be a lot of different things. So here's what I do in those cases. And I see this irregularly as I let the patient know this. It's okay. It's all good. When you're in the position to maybe switch the way you're thinking or not switch the way you're thinking, I'm here. I'm here all the way. If you want to stop smoking, let's do it together as a team. If you're not ready to stop smoking, maybe we can do it later as a team. Maybe not. But the decision always has to belong not to the doctor or the nurse, but it really ultimately has to take place with the patient. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. It absolutely won't work. So I sit with the patient. I stay with the patient. It could take weeks, months, rarely years to walk with them in the direction that's going to be healthier overall. And usually they get there, but demanding that they're going to take a pill, demanding that they take psychotherapy, demanding that they go to physical therapy usually doesn't work. Got it. So the goal is planting the seed. The goal is not completely convincing them. And I guess because of psychological reactance, right? Like if you tell them to do something, it makes them even less likely to do it. But if you just plant the seed, let them know you're here, you know, keep their confidence in you as a partner, then it goes a longer way towards getting them to recognize that that's going to be a benefit to them. You know, Brad, that's a great analogy, but I go a step further. It's planting the seed, but then every once in a while, watering that seed with them and making sure that there's appropriate sun and maybe some fertilization along the way, right? And you're doing it as a team. You're taking care of this plant that's going to flourish and eventually be six feet tall as a team. And I think that I know as a patient, I appreciate that when my doc is kind of walking me through this and really letting me make these decisions. And I know that most of the patients that I get to work with also appreciate that. I think that approach as well. So there's therapy and there's medication, right? And I want to talk about both of those. But aside yeah. from those two, two columns, is there anything else that I would be missing from treatment? There's a big piece. I would say there's a third component, and that component is what I would consider integrative or whole person care. And for many years, people are sort of have been unsure about what that means. Is that acupuncture? Or what is that exactly? Is that herbal medications? And I think that a big piece of this is letting the body heal itself, letting the body heal itself. And there's different ways to do that. Freeing your mind with meditation, for example. Mindfulness therapy, particularly when coupled with cognitive variable therapy, is an evidence-based, highly effective treatment for depression, anxiety, even fibromyalgia. And so combining a lot of these whole person care approaches. But that's still therapy. Those are different it, it, types of therapy, but that's still it, therapy. So it's not psychotherapy. A lot of times people are thinking there's either psychotherapy or there's medications, yeah. right? And I think there would be a third component, exactly, therapy. In this case, Therapy would be to enable the body itself towards a state of wellness, to promote wellness and even prevention as well. And then I would also, I guess, answer my own question, sleep, physical activity, and a good diet. Like those things are also integral to the management of mood disorders. 
just because I want to talk about medication and I want to talk about yeah. the different ways to go about therapy. So let's talk about medications because SSRIs have been, what, like 20, 25 years now? God, I'm older than I realized, maybe more. They yeah. really opened the door towards the medical management of mood disorder because they had a, a lower side effect profile than what was used previously. Can you give us like a five minute primer on SSRIs? Totally. And I'm going to be very practical here. So Prozac came out in the 1980s, Ooh. actually, a long time ago. And it's an SSRI. What's nice about Prozac is it's long acting. So if someone doesn't take the medication, you know, on a Wednesday and then again on a Saturday, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine because it stays in the body such a long time. Prozac is safe on the heart, the kidney, the liver and the brain. It's a great medication for the treatment of most anxiety disorders and depression. Let's look at some other common medications Lexapro. and hopefully this will be. Yeah, Lexapro is so Lex to be super common from my experience. Yeah, so Lexapro and Celexa are mirror images of each other. They're enantiomers, right? If you remember back to organic chemistry, they're just kind of flipped mirror images of each other. And so they work very, very similar way. They're SSRIs. They have decreased risk for drug interactions, right? For a lot of patients who, who are, you know, taking a lot of different medications, beta blockers, Coumadin and things like that. And then we have Zoloft, right? Zoloft is a medication that's very, very unique in that it's not only an SSRI, but at a little bit higher dose, it's a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. So around 100 to 150 milligrams, it has a dual effect. Those are some of the more common SSRIs. About 40% of the time in both men and women, there will be some degree potentially of sexual side effects. Again, about 40% or so could have some degree of sexual side effects. That can mean different things, decreased libido, for example. Then you have the SNRIs, right, which affect norepinephrine and serotonin. Those are also very effective. There's none better than the other, right? The SNRIs are very effective for the treatment of depression, anxiety, and also the treatment of neuropathic pain, most commonly diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Also very helpful for sciatic-related pain, pain that's starting in the back, lower lumbar region, it kind of moves down the buttocks and the leg. So very effective in that case. There's Wellbutrin or Bupropion, which is unique in that it doesn't affect serotonin. It doesn't affect serotonin. It affects dopamine and norepinephrine. The thing that's nice about Wellbutrin is it doesn't cause those sexual side effects because it does affect serotonin levels. The downside with Wellbutrin is it's not really good for the treatment of anxiety, right? So you can use it for the treatment of depression, not anxiety. It can actually make anxiety worse potentially. So you have to be careful with that. Also, you don't want to use it for folks who have eating disorders, or really a history of seizures, right? And then there's Remeron or Mirtazapine is a medication that we sometimes use. And this is an interesting medication because it affects what we call interneurons between serotonin and norepinephrine. So it's not strictly or exclusively a reuptake inhibitor. But here's the thing that's kind of interesting with Remeron is at low doses, it's really an antihistamine. It has a lot of H1 blockade. But at higher doses, you have less of that effect. You have less of the side effect of sedation, and it really becomes more of the antidepressant. So at higher doses can be a very effective antidepressant as well. That's a quick overview on some of the more commonly used antidepressants and when to use them and maybe when not use them. I'll, there's one more I forgot to mention, and that's Paxil or paroxetine. Paxil is an SSRI. It was used a lot in the 90s and early 2000s very effective for the treatment of depression and anxiety. The downside is that in women in childbearing age, it can cause issues, can cause malformation of heart valves, potentially autism. There's some debate about that. But here's the thing, more potential for side effects. That's the thing with Paxil. It's short acting. So if you forget to take it, you're likely to have what's called discontinuation syndrome, which means you feel not so good, mild flu-like symptoms, for about two or three days if you're coming off Paxil for just a few days. That is exactly what I was looking for. Amazing. Thank you Good. very much. Good. So then the last thing we need to talk about is therapy. So first, like, how do you recommend that someone even finds a therapist? Because let me tell you about my own experience finding a therapist. Yeah. I'm looking for yeah. one right now. I've had two in the past, looking for number three, you know, take a break each time. I'm just going on my insurance panel. Yeah. And it gives me a search engine based on proximity to me. And then I'm just going and looking at names and, yeah. you know, yeah. no idea where to go. Aside from that, I'm not looking in my friendly Facebook group. You know, I'm I'm fine 
talking about it on my podcast that is international, but I'm not, I'm not asking friends on my Facebook group also because then it doesn't give me the insurance information that, that for me is important. So yeah. what do you recommend for people in terms of finding a therapist? Well, first of all, Brad, it's messy. I mean, I'm just going to be just really clear about this. I mean, it's hard in many parts of this country to find a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or an, another type of psychotherapist. It's difficult. The wait times are long. The insurance companies may not always be as helpful as we would like when it comes to this, as you alluded to. So it's difficult. And this is one of the reasons, actually, that we train primary care providers on how to do what we call brief psychotherapy. So, for example, we train primary care providers how to introduce the idea of cognitive variable therapy to patients who can really benefit from it. We also teach what's called motivational interviewing to our primary care provider, our trainee trainers, learners. If you're listening, we do have an episode on motivational interviewing with one of my psychiatry colleagues from Long Island around here that we were doing nice. around the when the COVID vaccine first rolled out. So if you want to learn about more, there's a whole episode with Dr. Joe Weiner on motivational interviewing. Sorry, continue. Awesome. No, that's awesome. So psychotherapies are a key part of treatment for a lot of these disorders that we've talked about, right? It's not always just medications. And oftentimes, particularly with moderate and severe illness, it's a combination of psychotherapy or talk therapy and also use of medications. So unfortunately, we are there are a paucity of, psychother of psychotherapists. Many psychotherapists will take cash only, so they're not in your insurance system network. That's part of the problem. The other piece of this, Brad, is there aren't enough psychiatrists. And the projection over the next 10 to 15 years is that there will be even an increased paucity of psychiatrists given the need, the increased need that we have. Again, this is one of the reasons I, number one, advocate for increased number of psychiatry residency programs and slots, but two, train frontline primary care providers on how to do just some of the basics here. They're not going to be psychotherapists. They're very busy. They're too busy. But if we can get the ball rolling while they're waiting for a therapist, that's a win. We want to do is these mini therapies. Are you just like teaching them how to therapize themselves? Like what is that? I'm not quite understanding it. So cognitive variable therapy, I'd be happy to give a talk on this one and talk with you about this on a different podcast. But I'll tell you, it's very effective. And most people can pick up the basics of cognitive variable therapy by reading about it. They don't need to go to the therapist or spend a lot of time with the therapist some may need that, but most patients will read about it and go, oh my gosh, that's totally me. And they'll identify their own thoughts and behaviors with what they're reading and make those appropriate changes. So there are some cases where patients can use these tools for the rest of their life. And as you say, sort of therapize themselves, they can get better on their own. And that is the goal. That's, our, that's the psychiatrist's goal is to find ways in which the patient can improve on his or her own, right? To give them those tools instead of having them come back week after week for several years, right? We saw that back in the days of Freud and, you know, in the, in the last century. But now we have different types of psychotherapies, oftentimes labeled brief psychotherapies, which can be used long-term for patients. So let's say I'm a gastroenterologist. I have a patient that I know is having psychological undertones to their abdominal pain. Otolaryngologist, yeah. patients having tinnitus, that they're really having trouble with, and I know their anxiety is playing a big part. Is this CBT something that I would be able to use with them in, you know, what is a really brief visit? So what you could do, and this would take a minute and a half, is in your after visit summary, type in a reference, right? And what I usually recommend for my patients is the book Feeling Good by David Burns, pages one through 80, is a nice overview on what cognitive variable therapy is. So then the patient leaves your office, you're seeing another patient, and then they're getting the book, they're reading about it, and they have a rudimentary understanding of what CBT is. And then that can start the process, and hopefully they'll find a therapist within a matter of weeks or so. Can we just take a little bit of a deeper dive into CBT? So really, here's how cognitive variable therapy works, right? So we all know that if someone is not feeling good, right, you don't have to think about what that means, right? If you don't feel good, you know it, right? If you stub your toe, you're never going to look at your toe and go, what is that, right? You're going to know you stubbed your toe. If you get up in the morning and you're feeling depressed, you're going to know it, right? It's not something you need to contemplate or figure out. It's concrete. It's clear, right? You have that feeling of badness. Now, what we found is that we have 
thoughts that are connected to those feelings. And a feeling is usually a one word feeling, mad, sad, angry, jealous, upset, etc. A thought is usually three to four to five, maybe six words. And it's usually connected with the feeling. And thoughts that are not entirely accurate, like for example, I'm no good, or this pain will never go away, or my doctor never listens to me, these all or none catastrophic ways of thinking can often make those feelings worse. So what we try and do with cognitive behavioral therapy is we don't attack the feeling directly, we attack the thought and the inaccuracy of thought. And we look at it and we say, is that an accurate or inaccurate thought? If it's inaccurate, you flip it around to make it accurate in real time. And you do that once or twice or three or four times, and eventually what we find is the feeling, the depression or the anxiety, for example, get better, quantifiably get better. And so you're attacking the thoughts, not the feeling. And that's the essence, really, of cognitive behavioral therapy. Amazing. Is there anything else that we haven't covered today? I'm really surprised, actually, and impressed that we covered so much ground in so much so little time. But is there anything yeah. you think we missed that either primary care or specialist colleagues out there should should know to better equip them? Yeah, I'm not going to plug a book or anything like that. Those who are interested, those who are interested in learning more about what we say is primary care psychiatry or primary care substance use disorders or child adolescent psychiatry in the pediatrician's office, definitely look us up at the University of California, Irvine, the Train New Trainers Fellowships or TNT Fellowships. We have over 50 faculty, many of whom are duly boarded or trained in family medicine, psychiatry, internal medicine, psychiatry, pediatrics, and psychiatry. It's our mission to train up these frontline docs who are seeing depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric disorders every single day. And by the way, they're amazing. PCPs are amazing. They're working hard. They're the backbone of what we do in medicine. I certainly appreciate all that they do, and we want to support them as much as we can. And if anyone in GME is listening, it's important that we're training the doctors to actually reflect what they're going to be seeing when they're out there. And so more training in psychiatry, but it has to be, we have to do less training in something else. We have to figure out what we're training them that they're not actually using and then replace that with psychiatry. And I think really all patient facing specialists should at least get a little bit, not just when they're medical students, but in terms of what they see when they're done with their training as well. Amazing. Dr. Robert McCarron, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening. I have a favor to ask. You listened to the episode until the end, which means you either fell asleep or you really liked the episode. So please share it or like it or comment on a social media post or write us a five-star review, something. It would really help me out. And maybe what you learned from this episode can help someone else too. The views expressed in this episode are those of the interviewer and interviewee and don't represent the views of their employer or even their significant other. Even though the magic of podcasting make it sound like I'm talking directly to you, this is not a doctor-patient relationship and this is not medical advice or financial advice or really any advice. Thank us again for listening to The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.